So the conference has almost come to an end. We are came to the last speaker, that is me. He's also one of the organizers, and the only organizer then is going to give a talk today. And throughout the entire the conference. And without further ado, I introduce you Miki from the University of Vienna. Thanks, Umberto. Yeah, I'm sorry that I volunteered to give the last presentation. If not, we would already be on the beach. But since we had some cancellations, we were like, okay, let's do another talk. Um, usually, this is a 25 minutes talk, um, which is quite intense. Um, I extended it a little bit because we have more time and also to make it a little bit more funny. So, for the people watching it on YouTube, um, it's not going to be my serious, most serious talk. So what I'm talking about is the ELO rating. The ELO rating is um, the common uh, rating system in chess. Yeah? Chess is a quite old game. Like on Wikipedia, um, the first written rules were in 1840 in Arabia. Um, some predecessors, are, you know, predecessors are usually older. I think that's the definition. But most common, we, we learn in school that it was invented by India. It was like similar rules. Um, it has a quite useful game board where you can play much easier games than draws, for example. And I also want to show the game board because it's very good for explaining maths. Yeah? Because we all had in school, or most of us probably had in school, uh, the story about the exponential growth. Yeah? So there's an old story in India, so when the first written story about chances that the servant defeated the king. Um, the only question he had, like, yes, I would like to have one, uh, one uh, rice corn on the first one. Actually, it took me like two minutes or so to realize how he's ordering, like, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and so on. And then he doubles it, and the story, the little children should learn it. Um, that it's so, this is so much rice, we don't even have so many molecules in the universe. Um, some years later, um, rice is used to uh, explain how rich Jeff Bezos is, and it looks quite similar. So this is his income, and this is 100,000. And um, this has nothing to do with my talk. <laughs> and I was just <laughs> looking at the memes and I was trying to find uh, the rice chessboard, and then I remembered this TikTok video by Humphrey Talks. So. Um, yeah, the so story of chess was played in India 1,500 years ago, and then like chess is not a very popular game anymore. I think we saw some chess players here, but it's not like that every child learns it. But like last year, um, after in the second lockdown, like in the first lockdown, we were all watching Tiger King, and at least in Austria, um, the, the my popular um, TV show in the second lockdown was The Queen's Gambit. <coughs> I, um, I tried to find an Italian. Is this Italian? Yes. Very good. It was 50-50, Spanish, Italian, whatever. So yeah, I found an Italian poster, The Queen's Gambit. So chess is cool now again. Everyone started playing chess and uh, drinking booze while doing it. And we will now talk about the ELO rating, which is the rating system. So it was introduced uh, 60 years ago. Um, the last name and the name of the ra rating system is not a coincidence. He really called his rating system after himself. Um, 10 years later, it was um, adopted by FIDE, by the World Congress, um, in the, in the, on, at the World Congress in Sydney. Mm. There are now ex some extensions. So many, um, many countries changed to Clico. It's, uh, more elaborated rating system, I will talk a little bit later. And true skill is, for example, for all the people who like to play computer games, it's a traditional Microsoft rating system, which is very good for team play. So how does, how does the ELO rating um, use, like colloquially spoken? If I'm a very bad chess player, and Umberto is a very strong chess player, um, why is he stronger than me? If Umberto defeats me, he just gets a few amount of points because it's expected that he defeats me. But I, if, I, if I defeat him, I get a lot of points yeah, because the unexpected happens. So mathematically, there's a weight on the expected outcome depending on the rating. And this are the microscopic interaction rules we see here. 
So the first one is the rating after a game of me and of Umberto. This is a rating before the game. Yeah, so I use the star, the typical from the Boltzmann equation, a collision now, two particles collide, is here a game of chess. So um, SIJ is the uh, um, outcome. So zero for a, lose, a loss, 0 0.5 for a tie, and one for a win. And gamma is a scaling constant. It can be seen as the maximum amount of points. It's here in front of the bracket. And it's usually quite small compared to the rating, so obviously this is something we will use in the limit, yeah, in the limit process. And yes, this weighting I was telling you up, uh, before is usually done on, on, with the function b, which only depends on the difference, yeah? like what is our rating difference. It doesn't matter if we are both bad or both good, it's about what is our difference. And yeah, it's usually monotone increasing. Obviously, if I defeat a stronger player, I want more points, stuff like that. And it goes from, uh, zero, uh, from R to 0 to 1. And in, in modeling, what the first paper did in 2015, they moved it all a little bit. They said, OK, what is if P becomes an odd function? And then we have minus 1 as a loss instead of 0. And for example, B is um, chosen the tangent superbolicus, and the SNU is a scaling constant depending on how large our ratings in average. Like the ELO rating uses ratings from I think 1,500 to 2,500. I'm very bad in calculating with my head. So all the numerics you will see, I just moved down to the interval 410 and 010. Yeah, so it's much better to handle the ratings. And yes, some important properties about the function B because it's like important in all the analysis. As I told you, very often the tangent superbolicus is used, but everything you see is uh, B has to be odd, which is a symmetry argument. Yeah? Um, B is C3, which obviously not Elo said, so we said it because we needed an analysis reason. Uh, B is monotone, monotone increasing. Again, makes totally sense. I defeat a stronger player, I want more points. B is bounded, also makes sense from the application because there should be a maximum amount of points. And yeah, when B is bounded, I also need a curvature of constant L, which is true for the tangent superbolicus, for example. So, what's the comparison with, Bolz, with the Boltzmann equation Andrea introduced on Monday? Um, just to show you what's happening on a microscopic level. So, we have here uh, a lot of chess players, and the chess players have two properties. They have a hidden strength rho, which we don't know, like this is actually how good we are playing and they have a rating R. And then there comes a function W which chooses two players and they play against each other and then we update it in this way. He won, he raised his rating, uh, he lost the uh, rating decreases. Yeah? And um, it's the same amount, so we have some conservation of rating. And obviously what we want, what would make us happy is if after some time this random rating R represents our true strength rho. And actually, in numerical experiments, you see this. If you let this play long enough, it's updated via the bird scheme out of the famous uh, book from Parigi and Toscani. Um, really, after some time, a player with strength 5 will have rating 5 and so on. Strength 9, rating 9. So on a microscopic level, and this is what um, Arpad Elu also did in the 60s with numerical experiments, on the microscopic um, level, it looks like the experiments say, yes, the rating system is a good rating system. Because after some time, my rating is really my true strength. So, but obviously what kinetic people want to do is they want to prove it on a microscopic level because we only have experiments here. Yeah? So, there are some papers who looked at chess before it was cool. Um, first one is, I, in, all, in all papers we see, um, this is the main assumption. You assume that the expected outcome of a game depends of, on B of the difference of our strength. This can be directly motivated, so this is not an assumption which comes out of nowhere. It's an assumption you can directly motivate on the microscopic, uh, on the microscopic level. And then we have a very nice paper from Juncker and Chabot in 2015. They derived a kinetic model. I won't tell you how, you know, there is classic, it was very classically done. And it is a conservation law where you see the density at time t, strength rho, and rating r. 
And you see it only depends, we only have transport in the rating, yeah? because we update the rating after they play. And we have here a collision operator, A, um, which can be, yes, if you read it in Boltzmann, you would say this part is the gain term. So people who have the correct strength but the wrong rating enter through a collision. And this is the lost part. People who already have the perfect rating and when they play, you know, there will always be exchange of rating. They are the lost part. And this function W, I told you before, is the function which chooses which two players play against each other. So paper then, um, no, important for me is in my case, W is always greater than zero, which is a quite strong assumption because if I, um, if I uh, register tomorrow for the ELO rating, I won't play in the next years against the world champion. So actually the probability against playing against some strong one is zero. But for analysis reason, if it's at least a little bit greater than zero, it's good. There are also weaker results if this W is not greater than zero. So, and uh, one year later, there is a very nice master thesis, but sadly in German, um, where Katja Krupp, um, advised by Burger and Pitchman, I think most of the kinetic people know, they derived uh, a new model where they also introduced learning effects, because obviously we learn when we are playing, also when we are losing. So we have here now also a third term, and we have transport also in strength. Actually, this, um, this model um, is not a conservation law anymore, so we lose all this uh, conservation of mass and so on, and actually the rating for, both, for all players increase, they're going like to the moon, like the Bitcoin people would say, and um, yeah, but they, they could not really show anything at an analytically, just numerics, but it's just a master thesis. Yeah. And um, yeah, two years later, the Bertram Düring and Marie-Therese Wolfram, who I am now working with on this paper, um, they did a, a new kinetic model where they, they um, replaced the old learning from Katja Krupp with a little bit more complicated learning effect. And they also said, what if there is some performance fluctuation when you play? And this small performance fluctuation ends up in a diffusive term. But everyone knows, who here who knows kinetic model is like, no, this is just a trick, you know? We, we say there is some performance rotation because then we have, in the end, a PDE where we have a diffusive term, and this helps us a lot with analysis. Because actually, in the limits, this um, performance fluctuation becomes very, very small. And we will talk today mainly about <laughs> what, is, what happens to the ELO rating when there are very strong performance fluctuations. So I just want to man, uh, tell very briefly um, what Juncker and Shabar showed. They showed that um, the delta distribution of R minus rho is a solution, which means um, I have um, a steady state when my rating already represents my strength. This is actually exactly what I want. Yeah? If the rating represents the strength, my ill rating is good. And even better, they showed exponentially decay against it for W greater zero. So I think this is a very nice paper. Um, it mainly uses, every, in every step, it uses some symmetry of, uh, of B. But I think it's a very nice application because you could use kinetic theory to really prove is it a good rating system. Because actually, we never do that. We accept just the rating system. There is 100 years ago in soccer, uh, a win gave two points. Some years later, some old dude said, hey, why don't make it three points? And they replaced it. Yeah? No one, you know, we don't know which is the better rating system. So I think it's a very nice application from, from Jung and Chabot. And on a macroscopic level, this means if you have as initial data everywhere uh, constant mass, it gets concentrated at the diagonal. So it contracts to the diagonal, uh, which we also saw on a microscopic level. So um, we have, you see here again, strange seven, uh, rating seven, yeah? So it really represents everything. So obviously this is what we want to. So defining performance fluctuations, we start again with the same microscopic interaction rules because they are done by ELO. But um, 
this, this Sij, which depends on 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 logo, we now act, uh, let a, a, a random process act on it. So every time we play against each other, I have some performance fluctuation. Yeah, and we multiplied it. We will see in the numerics choosing 11 out of 23 players for a setup in a game. Obviously, this is motivated by soccer. The EU rating is now also used by the FIFA. But also, rating systems like the ELO ratings are used in poker. Obviously, poker is a game with a lot of performance fluctuations, not depending on me, but because of the card work clearance. Yeah. So, um, yes, and, but forget everything about the random process because we will just replace it with the expected value and the variance in the future. We don't do random processes. Main thing is we have one problem when we want to motivate again what is the expected value of Sij. Um, we have B is nonlinear, so different than before, I can't pull in the um, expected value. So this made us some troubles. So I was reading a lot of um, probability books, and um, you could use to solve this problem the law of the unconsciousness statistician. But I won't use it, but I think it's just a great name. You know? Like, why do they have so cool names? And also, I, but I will tell you um, why I won't use it. This law actually needs a lot of information. And when thinking about your kinetic model in the end, you're always like trying to, yeah, which properties do I want to give my uh, kinetic model? And I just want to give it the expected value theta and the variance sigma. And this law needs a lot more. So what else do we do when we have a nonlinear function we don't know how to treat? We always do a Taylor series expansion. Like it's the oldest trick in the world. Um, and we also did it here. Um, there is some, we, since we have a linearity of the, of the expected value and additivity of the variance, we can actually um, write this term as a Taylor expansion. This is the old one you can see in the Juncker and Chabot just replacing rho with the expected value theta. And here we now have a new term. This is why when you need it, b, is, uh, b has a derivative uh, smooth enough, uh, b smooth enough. And here we have this uh, term, which will make us a lot of problems. Because, um, uh, wait, uh, no, no. Now I will show you some numerics, yeah? So this is the picture I show you is one of the first ones I did. And um, we, uh, so I create 200 teams, 23 players each, and actually what I do is, um, in the first team, all players have strength 5, and then I enlarge in this interval. So, so in the last team, the players are between 0 and 10. And obviously this is how I get my variance. So you see my, the teams have increasing variance, but they all have like theta around 5. I think there are some outliers, but most of them are there. And this was the picture I, I looked at, and I, I got. I was also plotting the diagonal I mentioned. I was plotting a linear fit um, from this data cloud. And I was looking at it, and I was like, OK, I see nothing. Yeah? There is no steady state we saw before. You know, the very nice diagonal. But after looking at it some time, you see one clear pattern. All the weaker teams here, overperforming, they are all above the diagonal, and all the stronger teams here, underperforming, they are below the diagonal. So we saw this, and we were like, oh yeah, it would be nice to understand why that's happening. And hopefully at the end of my talk you will. And then we did another, that I, this one is a newer picture because we also made, um, wanted to do it a little bit more fancy. We created again 198 teams this time only, which have like an increasing theta. So first of you has four, next one has five, and next one is six. So we have increasing expected value, but we all have the same variance. Okay, we all have our fluctuations of the same order. And then we added two teams. There is a company called Gold Impact. They sell player ratings to companies. Actually, for example, Chelsea and Red Bull Salzburg are using it, so it's really successful, and it's rating the strengths of a player. And they published online the, the setup from Germany against Brazil in 2014, which I 
ever somewhat forgot, Germany won 7 to 1. So I took this data and I scaled it down because he has other, he has other sizes. And, um, but I only scaled it down in the expected value. I didn't scale it down in the variance. So you see all of those teams have very small variance. And Germany and Brazil have a lot of variance. And what's happening is um, we see on the microscopic level a clear steady state for all other 198 teams. But problem is it's not the diagonal. Yeah? And also more interesting, Brazil, which I scaled down to 9 because they lost against Germany. And Germany I scaled down to 10 because I'm German. Um, they totally underperform again. We see this, what we saw before, compared to, to the rest of the teams, there is some underperformance we wanted to understand. Yeah? Because in the end, they almost have the same rating. Yeah? This one has like 8.9, 9, I don't know, yeah? a little bit higher. Even, yeah? So I hope this motivates you enough to, to look at the kinetic model um, and try to understand this over and underperforming. Our kinetic model actually looks a very, very much like the, the Jung and Shabar model, only that we are integrating over R3 because we also have sigma as a property, and we have now this additive term, which destroys a lot because um, this whole term is still odd because of B is odd, B prime prime is odd, but we lost a lot of symmetry arguments to the previous paper. Um, results, yeah, just very briefly, we showed existence of a classical solution. We have a lot of conservation properties and moment properties, which mainly uses that B and B2 prime are odd. Most interesting is that the rating should, like the variance of the rating, the second moment in the rating, should decrease. So we should again see some contraction in direction R. And yeah, we adapted a numerical scheme. Yeah, let's skip this part. But there's a very nice paper. And I'm very bad in numerics and I understood this paper. So if you ever have to do a lot of um, conservation laws, read it. And yes, numerics. This is how it looks like. This is integrated in, um, obviously our, our, our solution is in 3D. Yeah, so we integrate in the direction sigma and we get here's this picture, here's theta from 4 to 10, and r from 4 to 10. And this looks to me like a steady state with some washing out you see here, here in the end. Yeah? So there, we have the idea, okay, there must be a steady state, um, but yeah, more about this later. And in, when we um, integrate in the direction theta, so we have here sigma, and here's a rating. We clearly see this contraction in direction R. Yeah, it moves together. But something very interesting is happening. Um, if my variance is large, yeah, like intuition, if my variance, my performance contagion is large, I would expect that my mass is transported along a wide scale because I have a lot of fluctuation. So I will have everywhere warm mass. But the interesting thing is, if the fluctuation is large, we have more can contraction than if we have no fluctuation at all. Yeah? You see, it's faster. And we will see in a moment why. Um, yeah. We simplified this model a lot. Why did we simplify it? You can remember on the microscopic level, we had this one nice picture when everyone has the same variance. Um, yeah, it looks like a steady state, let's ignore those two, yeah? So, so we said like, okay, if everyone has the same variance, we could interpret the integral over sigma as a point evaluation, yeah? So f is homogeneous in sigma. And then we get, uh, we, this is the old one, and we will uh, change this R3 here to R2. We integrate, this is why I only have here one sigma, and the half is gone and we have an, an RT operator, which is much easier to handle. Um, but, you know, obviously when we did this, we were like, okay, does this even make sense? Do we get something useful out of the simplified model? And what you do then is you look at numerics. Yeah? So since it's in R2, you see here not integration in one direction, 
but you see three different pictures. You see in the first picture sigma is 0 0.5, sigma is 1, sigma is 2. So I'm increasing the performance fluctuation, and what you see is it looks clearly there is a steady state. As this model clearly has a steady state, I have concentration on one line, but the weird thing is this line becomes more and more the horizontal when I'm increasing my variance. And back in the days when I first saw this, those pictures, I was like, damn, I have no idea what's going on. Then I was thinking a little bit about it. It's actually exactly what we want. If we have a rating system, but we have so high performance fluctuation that the rating system tells us, hey, I really have a problem with rating you because your fluctuation is so high, what in the end will, will it give to us, to all of us in the room, it will give us the same rating. Yeah? And this is what's happening when we increase the sigma and it's converging against the horizontal. So the horizontal here at 7 is exactly the average of 4 and 10. Yeah? 14, half, 7. So, but since we have concentration of mass and everything, yeah, it has to give us some rating. So it will give us all the same rating. So we were actually quite happy with this result when we understood this. And what's even nicer is we we see this on a microscopic level too. So we had the macroscopic model, we had this idea of the rating system, we went back to the microscopic level, and we have exactly the same behavior. Yeah? Here from 6.2 to 7.8 or something, 6, yeah, it's just exactly the same. Yeah? Okay, so we were very happy with our simplified model because something very important always is like, yes, what do I do with a kinetic model if it's has nothing to do with the microscopic model anymore. Yeah? You can do beautiful mass and everything, but it's also very nice if you have uh, something to apply. And uh, yeah, similar results as before. Let's skip this. We all want to go to the beach. Ah, yes, yeah, so this one is fun. Yeah. So I told you, like, Jung and Jabal found the steady state, and they really could show that the delta distribution is the steady state. And I was trying to find something similar, like that. If I replace here the R's with the perfect delta distribution, I'm mimicking this term and it's also zero and I have my steady state. And I think I was famous in Vienna and every mathematician was talking about, did Michi already bother you about finding the steady state? Yeah, everyone knew it. Because the problem is usually, my problem was with if I want to mimic it, I'm trying to mimic it at two spots at the same time. And this means I can't use inverse function theory, like all the classical analysis theorems, we understand there exists a function I couldn't apply. But I was looking for that for some months, and um, yeah, and one day, um, Josef, hi Josef, greetings to Stanford, he's now at Stanford, came to my office, was asking like, what are you doing, Michi? And I was like, the same day, I'm, I'm all, what I'm always doing, I'm trying to find the steady state. I even wrote a mathematical notebook to approximated algebraically and everything was a mess and he looked at the blackboard like yeah but there doesn't exist one I was like that was fast but he explained to me and it was right so I was like hunting a ghost for some months so we can't constrict it explicitly we will talk about it a little bit later yeah but there's one interesting thing is numerical results we looked at a lot of them told us like yeah if this nu is small enough we will retrieve what we want convergence of rating against the strength. Now everyone is looking at me, what was this new? Yeah, it was the scaling constant in the tangent superbolicus. Yeah? And obviously on a macroscopic level, um, this is this you, you know we can see hand waving. If nu is very small, there is the famous chain rule. So if I do here the second derivative, it comes out twice. And if nu is very, very small, this term is, go uh, this term is gone. Yeah, it's very, very small, and then we have the same behaviors like, like the Juncker and Chabot paper. So, but the nice thing is um, we could even prove it if we have an assumption which we need for some analysis tricks. So if B plus sigma square and its second derivative is monotone increasing, which can be always done, so I, I showed you one, I, I made this picture, one numerical example, at the beginning, it's not increasing, but then I'm choosing choosing new small enough that's so increasing again. If I make the sigma, uh, no, this one was this picture. 
Uh, but if I make the sigma small, uh, larger, I simply have to choose the new smaller, and I always get a, a monotone increasing part. For the tangent hyperbolicus, you have to solve this equation. I'm pretty sure no one knows what this trigonometric function is. I also don't, I don't even know how it's called, but it's, I plotted it, it's bounded by one. So this one is maximum minus two, and then I can use new small enough, depending on sigma, that this is really monotone increasing. So, and then we can do very much, which we could very strongly adapt from the Juncker and Chabot paper. Um, I can define my energy, which is motivated by the delta distribution. So the variance away from the diagonal, we have, this is decreasing over time. Let's skip the proof, let's skip the proof. And then just here, we can again, like Juncker and Chabot, uh, proof, but I was, I thought some, for some time it was wrong. So let's be honest, it's very often a conjecture in the end, but like on Wednesday, I think, you know, we are submitting it, this paper today, so the referees will tell you if it's a conjecture or a theory. Yeah? And um, we also have exponential decay against this diagonal, um, yeah, here in, uh, in exponential time. And this depends on the Lipschitz constant of L and L2. This is the Lipschitz constant of B2 prime. And therefore, it depends on nu. Yeah? So the nu is really governing. Um, how much, how fast this is this going to happen? So and the nice thing, again, we see nu also on a microscopic level. And I think this is the story of the paper, and in the end I think it's a very nice paper, uh, because we found an application. We were not looking for it, we totally found it on coincidence. Because on a microscopic level, the scaling constant is just supposed to be small. Like there's not really a size given. If you look, if you want to make a chess server and do the ILO rating there, um, they just write you, choose it small but not too small, okay? And Albert ILO himself choose 1 over 400 just to like copy paste the previous rating system, yeah? Because all the chess players wanted their rating system to be similar than before, so he chose 1 over 400 in, after a fitting process. But in our case, we see here, here we have this mentioned horizontal. The rating system gives us all the rating seven almost because it doesn't know what to do. When I decrease a nu by a factor of 10, so here it's one, here it's 0 0.1, I have the diagonal, but also what's very interesting is if we make it too small, convergence is happening slower. Yeah? So this one will also converge at the same amount of time, but slower. So our story of our paper is, what I will tell in the outlook is, like we have the best size for nu. So what did we do? We, made the, we uh, derived this large illerating model. We tried to find out some stuff and also showed the stuff numerically. Then we looked at the simplified model, which is much more interesting. It strongly agrees with the microscopic simulations. We have quite strong analytical results and especially like significance of nu occurs on yeah, which is like the story, and yeah, we gone. I gonna add it on Wikipedia because you know, I always wanted to be mentioned in Wikipedia. Yeah, and I can see that we will see if it will stay in the chess article. And yes, what's interesting? Um, can the steady state, which I told you, which doesn't exist, perhaps um, retrieved implicitly? Um, which ideas from the simplified model can be transferred for the model in R three? And also, like, what about other kinetic models? We started working on Clico. Clico is a rating system where you not only have a rating, but it also depends on when did you last time play it. So you get a punishment team. Because, for example, like, um, Kore played 10 years ago the last tournament, and he has the same rating like me. I played mine yesterday. So obviously, his rating, his rating is a little bit insecure. Yeah, will he be weaker, will he be stronger? So it's a very nice model, and I think you can uh, apply those techniques to, to also marry, marry, oops, I want, uh, something's missing, I wanted to mention. Uh, we also thought about applying it for Tinder. Tinder is in the end also just a rating system. There's a collision, we see each other, I give you a plus one, I'm swiping right, the other person's giving you a minus one, swiping left, yeah? But you could also try this out on other rating systems. Um, 
Yeah, thanks for your attention. Uh, I was told um, every mass uh, uh, talk now needs a meme. So I chose the I'm very small meme. It's called the name because this little dog um, is a constant new and it's a true hero of our paper and of the innovating. And yeah, thanks for listening and see you next year. Are there any questions? I guess so, right? No, I took. Are there any questions? Uh, so, thank you very much. And enjoy the last time today here at the beach. Uh, if you need anything, feel free to ask. And thank you again for coming. <laughs>